Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Addicted Mind podcast. My name is Dwayne Osterland, and I'm your host. Today, we have a special episode or a bonus episode. We're going to interview Greg Ostrom. He is the playwright of the new play, The Spy Who Went Into Rehab. And we're going to talk a little bit about the play he just wrote and its production. And it's really interesting because he is in recovery himself. He's been in recovery for quite a long time. And this idea came to him a little bit on a whim. And he started to put all the pieces together. They put it in a workshop. It got a really strong reception. And they decided to make it into a full play. And it's going on right now. Greg's going to talk a little bit about the play and what's really interesting about it, how the play evolved into not just talking about rehab and addiction from the lens of a spy like James Bond, but also looking at the whole cultural context behind it. So it's really interesting. Check it out. And I hope you enjoy this bonus episode. All right, everyone, welcome to the Addicted Mind. And today we've got a wonderful guest, Greg Ostrin. And he's going to talk about his play that he wrote called The Spy Who Went Into Rehab. That's correct. And we're going to go from there. So, Greg, it's running right now, right? The play is is running running right right now. First of all, Dwayne, thank you for having me. And I certainly can identify with an addicted mind. Awesome. Yeah, so the play is running. It opened this Friday, June 7th. It's running at the Pacific Resident Theater, which is, I will, the best way to access tickets, if anyone turns out to be interested, is PacificResidentTheater.org. But it's theater, T H E A. T R E and the theaters at 703 Venice Boulevard, Venice, California, 90291. It's Venice right below Washington. It is a, uh, it's a repertory company. It's a theater company that's been in Los Angeles for probably 40 or 50 years. They have awesome. three different spaces and, uh, yeah, we're on what's called the second stage. Awesome. And I will put all the links in the show notes at the addicted mind.com. So great. If this is something that you want to go to and check out, definitely encourage you to do that. All right. So, Greg, tell me about this play and tell me what what's it about. It really just got me interested, just the whole idea of it, because it's a yeah, comedy. It is. Well, uh, my my brother, who's in recovery as well, had said, well, what's the play about? Like, he didn't know the name of it or anything. And I said, it's called The Spy Who Went Into Rehab. He went, I got it. So a little background on me. Uh, So I've been sober 37 years. I got sober in 1987 at the tender age of 27. So do the math. I had, I was an actor for quite a while and then transitioned to the even more uh, reliable way of making a living, becoming a writer. (laughs) So I, I started out writing in, in LA theater and then got into writing movies and, and TV shows and also writing film and television marketing. I write movie trailers for a living and have for 25 years on some of the biggest movies you can name. But I always was able to balance that with a creative writing career. And I got back into the theater a few years ago because it had gotten very difficult to sell movie scripts in Hollywood because studios who used to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars a year on buying what they call spec scripts, scripts written on spec for no money, they found that they were stockpiling scripts and they weren't doing anything with them. And so that marketplace, which had been around for since the eighties collapsed and I had advertising work to keep me going, but I wanted to do something else to feed my soul. And I went back into playwriting and I had a couple plays produced. I had a play produced off Broadway right before COVID. I had a play produced in a theater in Canada 
during COVID. And those were plays for high. I was a writer for hire. And I got back to, and, and one, I, I stopped writing screenplays and everything. I just stopped for about a year. I just felt burned out on it and I didn't have anything that I wanted to write. And then one day, and I don't really even know what the inspiration was, but I was thinking about James Bond because as a, you know, I was born in 1960. So I grew up, I was a kid all during the, Bond the 60s. Movies. Yeah. I was a kid during the sixties and I loved the Bond movies. And, and so I imagined, I, I, it just started out as like a kind of a weird idea, almost like something that could be a TikTok video or something that I thought about, you know, James Bond, so, you know, now this is through the context of sobriety. The guy's an alcoholic because all he does is drink martinis all day. He's a sex addict because he tries to sleep with every woman he meets. Right. He's a gambling addict because he's always in a casino whenever he's got any downtime. And clearly he has anger issues because he kills people for a living. He actually has a license to kill. And so I imagined a James Bond-like character being, being at an intake at a rehab where where a counselor is like just saying so you know uh how many martinis do you drink a day hardly any three to five yeah. you know alcoholic how often you gamble anytime i'm in a you know luxurious casino how often is that not the often maybe five to seven times a week you know i'm Haven't never any, i'm like never gonna think of james bond in the same way now Exactly. <laughs> it's like, so oh my gosh. So I, I had that idea that I thought that's really kind of a funny idea. And so I just started writing it and it kind of evolved into a play. And my experience as a writer is if something is a good idea, the way I know it's a good idea is that it's not work to write it. It just the ideas flow. And if you're writing a comedy, really the key to that is – like any great comedy you can think of, you know, three buddies lose, you know, th three groomsmen lose the groom in Las Vegas and they have to get him home in two days and they can't remember anything that they did and they have to retrace their stuff. Any comedy that, that resonates, the setup is it provides you with all the jokes and stuff. Right. And right. so, yeah, so I wrote the play. But what I discovered in the play is that it's really – it became less about addiction and more about what what's become known as toxic masculinity because the other side is that that character was an icon for millions of men about yeah. how to be a man, how to be a guy. And, of course, we look at that now and even the people that make those movies, you know, the Daniel Craig James Bond is – a far cry from the Sean Connery James Bond or the Roger Moore James Bond because you can't treat women like that and, and, and it isn't cool to treat women like that. And guys who treat women like that are not cool. They're dicks, you know? And so that's really what the play becomes about is this guy has to relearn how to be a person in the world you know, and, and so that's, I think that's part of what resonates with the play is and that this, if it, this started to develop as you were writing it or was yeah. that you started to see this, you, you know, if you're getting in recovery, right. Recovery is about honesty, integrity, looking at yourself. So James Bond's got to look at this piece, right? He's got to look yeah. at this. Yeah, exactly. He has to look at, and, and it's, it's only through interacting. And again, the thing about it is in a way, you know, he's, he is kind of the, the character in the play is slightly <clears throat> anachronistic, you know, I mean, he is kind of like, it's almost, it's kind of like Austin Powers in that, but not as, you know, a different take on it. But that idea of Austin Powers yeah. was, was transmuted to our time. And, you know, but Austin Powers doesn't really ever learn any lessons. And he's, I mean, it's a brilliant movie and it's a brilliant character. And I had to make sure, and nobody has mentioned that in connection with the play, which I'm grateful for, because I had to make sure I wasn't repeating something that someone else had created. Yeah. You know, and yeah, so, and it, so what happened was the theater that we have, are doing it at, 
Pacific Resident Theater, they have a theater space designated for their actors. It's called the co-op. And if an actor wants to initiate a production there, they can, <clears throat> the theater will give them some money and they'll give them 12 performances. And so that's how it started. My friend Cindy Fujikawa, who's an actor and she's a director, she directed the play and she also acts in it. She's brilliant. She's a member of the theater and this was not her milieu. This was not the kind of thing she responded to. She didn't want to do something that had a, a male centric character who was, you know, very misogynistic. And, but she discovered that it was a great opportunity to explore these theories. And so we yeah. did the play first as a workshop, which meant no critics, no reviews. We have to get our own butts in the seats, which we did, you know, and uh -huh. we filled the house and we were so successful that the theater said, okay, let's, let's reconfigure it a little bit and let's do it as one of our main productions. And so that's where we're at right now. Wow. How exciting. So people started to, to, to see this and say, this, this really resonates. This is a really, this is a really good idea. I mean, yeah. what a change in the lens. Exactly. And, and it is, you know, somebody who saw it the other night was said to me, you know, it could have just been a one joke thing, like a sketch. You, you managed to kind of make it this other thing. And I said, yeah, it has to be any idea, no matter how big an idea, it has to be about something more than just the idea. Right. And somebody, I was, what I was going to say before was that at the opening night party, this woman who I did not know came up to me and she said, how much of this is you? Uh, and I said, all question. Of it. I said, all of it. So that's the other part is that it really sort of became a play about my own history with relationships and with substances and with people. And so it was, that's why that's another part of it where it feels so personal to me, even though of course, I'm not, or nor was I a spy, but I certainly indulged myself as, as all addicts do. Yeah. And I think, you know, part of our culture, you know, like you said, you know, sixties and seventies, this was, this was the, the, this was the information that was given to, to men, to, to boys about how you're supposed to be a man. I mean, you get stuck yeah. in what you call the man box, yeah. right. And to be able yeah. to shine light on that, there's a lot of freedom outside of that. Absolutely. So even though this is a, this is a comedy, it has a really serious undertone to it. Yeah. Yeah, it does. And, and there are moments in the play where it does get serious. And I realize that doesn't take away from the comedy that only enhances the comedy. You know, yeah. it, it does need to be about more than just jokes that they're done. Any great comedy that you can think of, with very few exceptions is always going to have a moment of poignancy in there where the characters are real and you, you see their struggles and then you go back to the fun again and stuff like that. And you get, you, and it, and it goes full circle. You see the whole, the whole thing. Exactly. So you took this, you took it. Uh, it was a success in the, I guess you said the, 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 the trial. Workshop. Yeah, the workshop and people really resonated with this and said, this is a great idea. Mm -hmm. And you got such a great response. And now it sounds like it's really taking off. Well, you know, from your mouth to God's ears, as my people, the Jews like to say, and that would be nice. Uh, yeah, we've gotten a couple of reviews in so far that have been really positive. I mean, you know, the thing that's interesting is that because I lived in New York in the 80s and w worked a little in New York theater, but certainly went to see a lot of theater and I continually anytime I go back and, you know, Los Angeles. And even when you talk about Los Angeles, Los Angeles is more of a concept than a city. Los Angeles is Hollywood and it's the Valley and it's Pasadena and it's the West side and it's the Marina and it's, it's South central and it's Brentwood and Santa Monica. I mean, it's all of these different communities, but it's not a theater community per se. There are a lot of theaters and there are a lot of places to do theater in Los Angeles, but other than some of the big professional flagship theaters, which tend to mostly do either the tours of Broadway shows or plays that have been hits on Broadway or off Broadway. So they're done. They're brought out here. 
it's very challenging and to get people to come see. And the majority of these smaller theaters don't do original plays. They do revivals of well-known plays. And so it, what I've discovered is, and I think I was somewhat naively like, no, this is great. It's a new play. Who doesn't want a new play? Well, a new play is a real risk because yeah. you don't know if people are going to come see it. Maybe they will. Maybe they won't. And I feel that I, the last original play I wrote was in 2010, and it was at a theater in Studio City. And we got some good reviews. And this was back when the LA Weekly was still around. And the LA Weekly at the time was sort of the arbiter of what you went to see or what you didn't go to see. And they didn't give us a great review. So we didn't get a recommendation. And so we didn't get a lot of traction. We didn't get a lot of people. And, and it was a really good play. And I just, I kind of got pissed off at the critics in Los Angeles because I thought, you know, we're not given any credit out here for developing any theater, but nobody's helping that. You know, I'm not saying give a good review if the play is terrible, but I'm saying cut some slack because it's an investment in theater in Los Angeles. And it's, it's never going to be New York. It's never going to be, it's not even going to be Chicago. But also New York and Chicago are much smaller cities relative to all of the land that you have out here in in what we call Los Angeles. So in small communities like San Diego has a has its own theater community right, right. and you know, there's stuff in Santa Barbara and there's like little re- like Santa Monica, you know, there's regional areas Places, where there's yeah. theater. You know. And I mean Traditionally, we're a movie-going city, but people aren't even going to the movies anymore. You know, yeah, so it's even harder just staying at home. Yeah, it's even harder to get people out there. How's the the reception been for you know the recovery community and you know discussing this topic of uh, sobriety and and substance use and especially in you know the the current climate of of uh, addiction as an epidemic. Well, you know, it's interesting because, I mean, the people who I know from the recovery community and, you know, look, the thing about the thing about the recovery community is, is that, you know, when I got sober, you didn't have anybody talking about it yet in the media, you know, it was still anonymous and it was still under the table and it was not like it is now. So there is a certain level of anonymity when when you talk about this stuff and, and to be respectful of that process. But I have people from, you know, meetings that I go to have come to see it and they love it. You know, they, they laugh their, you know, behinds off because there's certain little Easter eggs and lines in there that they resonate with what we have started. And I haven't, our director, Cindy is, is checking we are having, I think, every performance, a small percentage of people in recovery coming to see it, I think, from specific rehabs. And apparently, they really liked it, but we're going to try to get some feedback on that. But I know that, you know, I, I there's a meeting I go to, and it's a, and literally, I think, 25 guys from that meeting, like, they're like, okay, we're going to go see the play, you know, June 23rd, and blah, 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 you know, and it's like, so right, right. I think that the, it's been very, it, you know, I, I think that the recovery community absolutely loves it because they identify what's more interesting are the people who aren't in the recovery community or who yeah. don't have a lot of experience with it because that to me, that's really the test. You know, it's like, can you go and see something that it has nothing to do with your own life experience, but you are just still, you, you're taken in with it. You know, you're just, you just love it. Yeah. And it's like anything, you know, I mean, there, there are movies and television shows about worlds that a lot of people would never even think to be a part of or want to be a part yeah. of, but it's compelling because the story at the center is compelling. And I think, Look, we are an addictive culture. I mean, it, yeah. you don't have to be hooked on pills or booze or sex, or but it could be shopping, it could be working out, 
It could be eating. I mean, everybody in this country has some kind of an eating disorder. Either they overeat yeah. or they undereat or they're terrified of doing either. You know, we, 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 we're constantly being, you know, I mean, I, a friend of mine, a friend, my the person that I'm seeing took me to Costco yesterday and I bought one thing, which was a bulk box of coffee pods because that's what I use. But I was like, I could easily drop two or three hundred dollars here on stuff I don't need. But yeah. it's here. And I was like, Costco represents the the shopping mentality. It's like here, everything you can want in huge bulk, buy it, you know? Yeah. And that's that's what we're that's what we're conditioned to do. We're consumers. Yeah, and so, the universality of of the of this topic, the universality, like yeah. you, that you know, on some level, everyone can relate to this in some in some way. Yeah, that's like, yeah, yeah. I, I get it. And then they can get into the story and get into the humor of it. And then once yeah. again, if it really resonates with your experience, it sounds like you you get those Easter eggs. You get the the deeper meaning there. It has. Well, an I mean, even I'll more tell you, for example, and, my daughter who's eighteen my youngest kid. I don't think she's ever seen a James Bond movie in her life, but she's very plugged into the culture. So she saw the play. She came and saw it twice. And there's a scene in the opening when he's being interviewed. I call the character Simon Cross. I, cause you know, legally I can't call him James Bond. And I actually have more freedom making him fictional, but he, his name is Simon Cross. But, and the, the uh, woman who's, running the rehab, she asks him his name and then she starts to say, well, my name is, and he said, no, let me guess. Let me guess. And, you know, he starts to list off, you know, all these names like Ferrara Easy Lay and <laughs> Marzipan Sweet Tooth and Luna Godbody, like all of those ridiculous names that women were given. Well, my yep. daughter totally got it. Without wow. knowing what it was from, she totally understood, oh, yeah, this guy is in a world where women have these wacky names. So that's the other thing. If you are a – if you're of a certain age, and really I think anyone 25 or older is going to get it, maybe even teenagers, if you have any familiarity with those movies, you're certainly – it's certainly – you're going to – because it really what I did – is I looked at every one of the tropes. You know, I have a group yeah. therapy scene where they say, did you ever kill anybody? And he says, okay, I'll tell you one story. And he tells a story about killing a guy. And then, and then he throws in, you know, one of those famous quips at the end, like, sorry to hang you up, old boy. Uh, your, your personality <laughs> is shocking. And they're like, oh my God, how did you think of that? You know? And the therapist is like, that's, you're using humor to process trauma. That's terrible. You know, so it's like, yeah. it's like using every one of the tropes from those movies and those characters, but putting them in the context of, you know, a, a, for want of a better word, a woke culture, which can be, I'm not using that term negatively. I'm using it with the intention of being awake, of being aware that, right. that kind of every aspect of it is just it, it's crazy but 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 it's such a part of our culture you know yeah, and even it though it becomes English, a reflection of that right so that absolutely. we can actually see it from a different lens and we can start to to process it and and really yeah. that's what i think makes any good movie or play or whatever really awesome is that it's not just that piece on the surface but it talks to that undercurrent that speaks to us on a, on a deep level and makes us reflect. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, there's a reason why certain characters in our culture last, you know, and, yeah. you know, I mean, and we still, we see it with Star Wars and we see it with Harry Potter, even though Harry Potter's not been around as long or, or Sherlock Holmes or James Bond or, you know, and all, all of these super Superman and Batman and, you know, we're living in a time where those pop culture icons are our main source of entertainment. And, 
for, for better or for worse, gangsters, you know, like, I mean, the Sopranos sort of did this great job of taking all of the stuff that we think we know about the mafia. And it's like, okay, we're going to put it in the context of a family. And, you know, we're not, we're not spoofing it per se, because these are very serious characters and serious consequences. Right, right. But we, we have amassed so much, so much cultural information about all of these different types of characters and they all have their stereotypes, you know? And yep. so, yeah, whenever you have fun with it, it's like, Oh my God. And, but again, it's like the, to me, the thing that the engine that drives it is the fish out of water element of a spy going into a traditional rehabilitation center and dealing with his issues. That's awesome. Greg, I just want to thank you for like putting it all out there and making this play and taking your own recovery and your thank knowledge you. of your own recovery and putting it out there. Because once again, even though it's, it's a comedy, it's, it's, it's more than that. It's, it's, it's a reflection too. And I guess that's how we learn. So how can people, you said it at the beginning, but I, I want to say it again. How can people find the information on this play? I'll put the links in the show notes again. But Yeah, so so it's at Pacific Resident Theater. If you go to Pacific Resident Theater, so that's P-A-C-I-F-I-C-R-E-S-I-D-E-N-T-T-H-E-A-T-R-E.org. So it's Theater of the British Way, Pacific Resident Theater, theater, R-E dot org. You can get tickets. You can also go on today's ticks, T O D Y S T I X dot com, and type in spy and it'll come up with their half price tickets. The theater number is 310 822 8392. Call now and you'll get a free uh, Walther PPK uh, gun and a license to kill. Um, <laughs> no, I kid. I kid. We're in Long Beach, so we can't joke about that stuff. But yeah, I mean, it's it's a really fun. It's the show's not very long. It's like an hour and ten minutes, no intermission. And yeah, that's so PacificResidentTheater.org or today's ticks, the spy who went into rehab. Awesome. Thank you, Greg, for putting that out there. Thank you for coming on and and just and talking about the show and it's Absolutely running right now. Thank so. You. If you can't remember any of those links, just go to theaddictedmind.com. They'll be there. Greg, thanks for coming on The Addicted Mind and sharing your work. Thanks, Dwayne. Thanks for having a great podcast and, and for putting your stuff out there as well. Really appreciate it. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening to The Addicted Mind podcast. All the links will be in the show notes. So check them out there and check out the play, The Spy Who Went Into Rehab running for the next month, maybe a little bit longer. So check that out. All right, everyone, have a wonderful day and I will talk to you 